they're very, very dangerous. If you spotty sense, you know, I was like, oh, something's off. And I'm just like, man, I'm waiting to hear something, you know. Get the crowd warmed up. It's Mr. Yehovah Tiger. What's going on, guys? It's uh, your host, Yehovah Tiger. So, you know, the first two episodes, I appreciate everybody, you know, listening in and and kind of giving, you know, some some feedback. I know the first episode was kind of cheeks on the audio because I was trying out different uh, headphones. They're like a microphone type setup, and, and it really wasn't that great. But I appreciate you guys still listening in. Um, the second episode, um, we added that, that intro, you know, had to, had to include, you know, some clips, so... Like I said, I appreciate you guys listening in and and, and 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 just basically just listening, you know. That's what it is. I guess it's a podcast, but um, I like to keep these episodes short, so I'm going to get right to it. So, you, this past uh, this past week, this past Sunday, really, was the series finale of The Walking Dead. I'm sick. Not really sick, but more like, I'm sad. You know, I remember watching that... 2010 Halloween night. I think I was a sophomore in high school, and it hooked me from then on. You know, I'm gonna go ahead and give some spoilers. They did show Rick and Michonne. Rick Rick got took. He continues to be took, and they gotta find him. Which, whoever that may be, Michonne, I guess. But they'll have some some kind of new series coming out, spinoffs, and so I'm excited for that. But I'm not gonna really deep dive on Walking Dead because. You know, I guess people fell out during Glenn. It was kind of ice cold, but, you know, the later seasons, they kind of, you know, they weren't that great after he died, but then they got better again. So check it out, guys. AMC Plus, all the whole shebang, but yeah, that's what I was watching it on. But dang, they had a documentary that had me kind of, I was kind of shook. And like, Betsy was kind of making fun of me because she's like, dang, you better start crying over there. And I'm like, Nah, not really, but yeah, it had me it had me feeling some type of way because it had all the old actors from season one and two, and so it was cool. It was real cool, but but uh, you know, so you know, it's kind of kind of crazy. But I had been doing some some research and kind of looking at things, and on Unsolved Mysteries of the Reservation, we did talk about missing four one one. We hit the the bare bones basic uh, on the topic. Basically, gave out some of the famous cases of the of of the movies, and you know, I gave out some information when it comes to the books, and and the guys kind of came down to a kind of a thought that it was LP was doing it to these people. And for me, I don't know. I I have reservations on that. I mean, I believe some of it could be, but. The case that I'm going to talk about three cases, and we're going to this we're going to totally take it in a different direction. Um, so all these three cases I'm going to talk about tonight, and I'm going to, we're going to talk. This is basically the name of this episode is mysterious mysterious uh, disappearances. It's a part one. There's going to be more parts to this, but these cases all involve cell phones. So as you mentioned, as I mentioned before, Missing 411, if you haven't listened to the Unsolved Mysteries of the Reservation podcast, Missing 411 episode, um, there's different plot points that he uses, David Polites uses. Um, one of it is that cadaver dogs or the scent trail, they can't get a scent trail on the bodies or on anything regarding this person or this child. Um, bad weather, um, you know, body ends up in a body of water. Or you know, in a stream, river, creek, um, there's usually boulder fills within the area. Um, another plot point, and I'm just doing these off the top of the dome because I'm, I had it all a whole list about them, but you know, but basically, you know, they go off to the side of a trail and they end up missing, and the body's found. Like they'll do these whole search grids, and you know. The search and rescue will do this search grid, and the body will be found within one of the search like search grids that they searched. Um, so a lot of weird, kind of unexplained type, uh, you know, occurrences. 
when it comes to the, this topic. And I'm going to play some clips throughout this, you know, of each case. And to me, the this is, with technology the way it is nowadays, I kind of, you know, think back to what... You know, what they didn't have back in the day. So you couldn't really like, oh, you can't pinpoint, pinpoint somebody's location. But these three cases, they, they do that. They pinpoint these locations of of these people that go missing. and Or like their phone battery drains fast or some weird things. But So the first um, clip I'm going to play is, a, is William Hurley. Um, I'm going to play that now of a Quincy man who vanished without a trace is pleading for his safe return. William Hurley disappeared after calling his girlfriend to pick him up at a Bruins game last week. Beth Germano is live now in Boston. Beth, this remains a real mystery to his family. Jack, because there was a cell phone conversation with his girlfriend as he was standing here along Nashua Street about 8.30 last Thursday night, and suddenly he was gone. His mother came in from North Carolina yesterday waiting for any word on her son. And so far, there's been none. So William Hurley, he was kind of a younger dude. Um, a super weird case that you know he was involved with. But basically, he's from North Carolina, and he moves to Quincy, Massachusetts to be with his, his girlfriend. Um, and on October 8, 2009, he attended a Bruins game. Uh, with his buddy, and during the game, we use the first part of the game, he started feeling real kind of not right. Like he just, you know, just all of a sudden felt really tired, and he was like, "Man, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jet out of here. I'm gonna call my girlfriend, and so, you know, to come pick him up." And so he he goes and um, calls his girlfriend, and he doesn't really know where he's at, like in terms of the streets, and so. You know, his girlfriend, who after the fact says, hey, there was a guy that was behind them that was, you know, sharing, um, that was sharing like different, how I say, where he was at. Not coordinates, but basically his address. And the guy said, hey, you, uh, you're you on 99 in Nashwood, I believe is what they said, street. And so then shortly after that, you know, he, he tells his girlfriend, you know, he's trying to, you know, she's trying to get to where he is, he's at. He says, hey, my battery's going dead, and then it dies. It The phone, her, his battery dies just as she's making the turn to where he's at. And she, you know, she goes, goes to where he's exactly at, and he's nowhere to be found. Like, gone. And she started asking people, hey, did you see this man? Did you see this man? And everybody's like, I don't know what you're talking about. I never saw this guy. You know, people are just kind of hanging outside. And, and they never, they didn't find him that night. But the kind of the weird thing about that case, and it's been connected, you know, each kind of, people have theories, but basically they think somebody took him or if he had some type of, you know, debt or something, but that's a theory that I, that I was reading and during researching, but basically he, the only bit of information that they found about him or that they found regarding evidence was his phone was smashed to pieces and they really couldn't explain why, and they had the only way they could identify it was basically by the serial number. Um, and then a couple of days later, basically, uh, he was found on the Charles uh, River, about 25 feet from the shore. And they had to, they ruled out a, a like a murder type robbery gone wrong uh, because he had literally everything on him: cash, wallet. Um, he had no signs of injury, um, and you know, so there was kind of weird, but. What happened to him is still kind of up in the air. Nobody truly knows what happened to William, William Hurley. And, and you know, that's a crazy case, you know, because, you know, he just got took. And just, you know, they didn't ever know what happened to him. But, but uh, you know, kind of just moving moving forward, you know. Just like I said, it's just a crazy case. But moving forward. Um, now, this one is pretty wild. Um, it involves a 31-year-old. Um, his name was Henry McCabe. Henry McCabe was, uh, you know, he was in town at a local, kind of a local club or bar, um, and his wife was out of town, and she was all the way in California, and he basically went out with, with a buddy of his, and let's see here, so he was in Spring Lake Park, um, September 17th, 2000, 2015. Um, and he never returned home, which was another thing. He, his wife, um, like I said, she was in California. 
she wakes up about like 2.35 in the morning and gets this crazy voicemail. It's a voicemail unlike anything you've ever heard before. There are two minutes worth of noises, bizarre ones. But very little actual talking. Authorities confirmed the disturbing middle of the night call came from Henry McCabe's cell phone. So she gets this, that crazy, just like, it sounds like groans and like, like someone's in pain. And then, you know, and then it doesn't show it in that clip, but in the, in the whole two minute long voicemail at the end, it says, stop it, which is super kind of crazy. But the last person to see McCabe was a friend who dropped him off at a convenience store, which let's keep it real. That's kind of wild to drop your friend off at a convenience store. Like, what is he doing? You know, trying to get that last call, I guess. I don't know, but I would never, you know, that's just something me, I wouldn't drop my friend off at a convenience store, especially if I know if he's maybe sauced out or, but his friend dropped him off at the convenience store and they basically searched the area, you know, to a point where, you know, they could find nothing of him, like at all. But the crazy thing about that last call that he made to his, that you know, to the voicemail, it was nowhere near where his friend claimed he dropped him off, which is kind of wild. He the basically the, the the call was pinged at a place called Rice Creek Park near New Bridgeton. I'm probably not pronouncing that right at all, which is a totally different area, like not even in close to where he was dropped off. Um, and so they did a search, and on November fourth, um, 2015, McCabe's body was discovered floating in Rush Lake um, near where they found it, like near where they got his cell phone ping and. Basically, they come to the autopsy and it says he drowned, which, how did he end up in that lake, you know? And basically, his case is still, you know, unsolved to this day. Um, But to me, what's very weird and doesn't add up is, you know, if he drowned, then what was up with that voicemail to his wife? You know, it's basically like groans and grunts and, you know, it sounded like somebody was kind of torturing him a little bit, Um, you know, and... it just didn't, it just, it's not right, you know, it's just not something that, that he, you know, to be inflicted that much, like almost pain, but the crazy part about it, his body had no signs of trauma or injury, so, you know, what was that, or who was that, that was, you know, behind that, you know, but behind the voicemail that said stop it at the end, you know, we, we may never know, but it's just crazy, you know, that, that, you know, he, you know, disappeared and was found and then there was no signs, um, which is similar to the next case, um, that we're going to talk about. And to me, this is maybe the most wild of the bunch. Um, Henry McCage is up there as a top, it's a top missing case, but one thing, um, so this is, uh, next one is about Colin Finnerty. uh, Finnerty, if I'm pronouncing his name incorrectly, I apologize. He was a, a fam- he played for uh, Grand Valley State, which is a Division Three. He led him to two national championship games. Um, he was signed by the Baltimore Ravens. He's, you know, he is an NFL quarterback, legitimate athlete. So basically, Colin Finner- Finnerty, you know, was basically dropped off by his family. It was a fishing trip on Memorial Day weekend, and at the point during, at you know, some points during his trip, like uh, towards the end. He makes this crazy call to his wife in which that he claimed that he's being followed and that he was very scared and frightened. Like, you, you could tell it in his breath that he was just like, and this is what, according to his wife, that he was just breathing so hard and he was so upset and there's something, you know, going on that he was in the woods. And so one, one thing that was kind of weird was that he may, said to his wife that, hey, I'm, I'm taking my clothes off, which, you know, without giving any reason, you know, why would, you know, I don't understand that, why he would tell his wife and then take his clothes off. Well, then after that, his phone went dead. And this was, and this is the last time anyone spoke to him. His wife was the last person. Um, and he did not return from his, uh, from his, his fishing trip. Um, and they launched a search. And during the search, now this is, like I said, going back to the cell phone where things are getting pinged and they're not really where they usually are. His phone was pinged several times, um, and you know, because they were trying to find his location of where he was, and each time the ping was found to be far to be farther away than uh, where it was in the previous location. So something is 
carrying his phone, possibly. You know, and it's kind of wild. Like, is it somebody, you know, you know, or is it him that's on the run or on the move that's like trying to get away or, but they couldn't find him. He was un, like, he just, they couldn't find him. And then finally on May 28th, 2013, they found him. Um, and he was in a dense wood about a mile from the location of his fishing boat, which is also kind of weird because if, if his phone is being beamed everywhere, but he ends up back at his boat. It's kind of strange, um, and he wasn't found. He was far found from next, like basically not too far from like a busy road where like multiple people could see him. The weird thing about his body when they found it, it had no signs of trauma or external injuries, um, and he had been well dressed. Because if you remember, like I said, his wife said that he said that he was taking his clothes off, and so that was kind of strange that he was not nude or he just was basically well dressed for the occasion. And so it just doesn't make sense. It just, you know, it doesn't, you know, the logical mind, you can't make sense of this. Well, they did an optop- optopsy and two, de- two, two separate autopsies, basically. Now, this gets into another kind of, I wouldn't say conspiracy, but I would say it's very interesting. One of them, of the autopsy said that he never, he didn't have anything to drink. Basically, he, you know, they couldn't find the cause of death and it came back in, uh, inconclusive another autopsy was done and basically said that he had cte he had high levels of cte um they found drugs and alcohol in his, in his system um and it just was kind of weird um that like they said it was a con- like basically it was a like complications of factors well, because he, and he, this is one thing too that kind of led into that is basically his family had said that he had had concussions, or his brother, I believe. And then, so that's why they were like, well, it's got to be CTE, because no one, you know, you guys heard stories like Junior Seau, like he wasn't making no sense when he was talking, and he just had memory loss and, you know, just couldn't really get together. But they also, you know, found out that he was taking Oxycontin, or Oxycodone, I'm sorry, for a back injury that he had. And the thing that's kind of, you know, they say that he could have been inebriated and fell and then, but that doesn't make sense if his phone was still on the move. And so his whole thing, I mean, even his family will defend him and say that he, football made him the person he is. He's successful because of football and football did not do this to him. And his family to this day um, had even said that. So to this day, like I said, and you know, even to this day, they, you know, I've seen the NFL put out like some type of lost, you know, oh, it's CTE, it's CTE. Um, but there's just too many weird things about the his case that it doesn't make sense, especially like with the cell phone, uh, with him taking his clothes off, but then he's fully dressed. Um, it just doesn't make sense, and and that's one thing about these missing 411 cases that just a lot of them don't make sense. Um, you know, like I said, the plot points, you try to get it, and David Pilates does a really good job of where he tries to, you know, bring all the facts to the table. And, you know, I hear people, you know, say things over here and over there, and which is fine. Anyone's up, you know, they're up for their own opinion. But my opinion is, is that I think he is trying to get to the, the basis of what this is. And I'm, my opinion on it, I don't really think that it's LP or Bigfoot or, werewolves or aliens you know i i think my opinion of it is it 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 varies depending on the types of cases um but with that being said guys um this is the first part of the of the mysterious disappearances um you know we'll get into other ones i know that uh, there's you know there's different types of cases for instance like i'll do one on children who have you know who has been missing um, I have a few of them that have, you know, with people with like, uh, that are on the spectrum, like autism. We'll do some cases on that because those are kind of super weird too. Um, we'll do some on, on hunters. Um, we'll do some on, uh, people with German descent. You know, I'm going to touch into this and this is not just a, a, a one-off. This is going to be multiple parts. And then I think at the end, once I, once we dive deeper into each, different facet of this. Um, I think I'll come up with a, with a, a legitimate opinion for you guys, but I'm curious to see what you guys think of the three cases that I mentioned, especially when it comes to the cell phone aspect of it, of being pinged in different locations, but then their bodies found in, or, you know, or they're being pinged in a different location than what they were last seen. Um, if you got, yeah, when you guys hear this, you know, like I said, hit the comments or, 
you know, or shoot me a message uh, on Facebook, Yahola Tiger, um, TikTok, One Man Band 918. Um, shoot me a message on there. Let me know what you think and what you think Missing 411 could be or what you think these three cases could be. If you think it's a serial killer, you think it's, you know, one theory was a smiley face killer. Right now, Tulsa County deputies need help finding a missing elderly man from Turley. The sheriff's office issued a silver alert for 76-year-old Jack Grimes after he and his friend Dwayne Shelby didn't show up to a horse show in Fort Worth. Family members say they have not heard from Grimes or Shelby since Friday. Deputies say the men were traveling in Grimes' maroon 2001 Ford Taurus with the Oklahoma plate ETW614. If you know where these men are or if you see their car, call 911. So Jack Grimes and Dwayne Selby um, on October 21st and 22nd, it was reported on 21st, um, as you guys heard, a uh, silver alert was, uh, was activated uh, for Jack Grimes. Um, he was obviously supposed to meet his friend Dwayne, and they're supposed to go to uh, basically a kind of a show, horse show in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, they, I don't, they they never made it, um, is you know according to the the reports. Um, but they were supposed to return on uh, home on that Monday, but no one had heard anything, hadn't received any calls. They basically the family was reaching out trying to call, and it was a lot of unanswered calls. Um, and the family was also worried that Grimes, you know, could have had you know that he had diabetes, and then he he needed to take some medicine, his insulin, um, and so they never heard nothing from those guys. And, you know, later on in the week, as, as things continue to kind of, um, you know, snowball, more information gets out there, um, their car was found. Um, and the deputies immediately started searching. When they found the car, um, they began to search for the two men in Mohawk Park in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, they, you know, basically found it around 4.30 in the morning. Um, and they basically deployed their canine unit uh, into the park. But they, uh, they, you know, didn't find anything of either man. Uh, family members also kind of mentioned too that uh, they were seen at a cafe in Parcel around six thirty on Friday night. Um, but the sheriff's office, Tulsa County Sheriff's Office, they basically reported and contacted the restaurant, and they could not corroborate that they, those those men were there uh, Friday night. And so, with those guys going missing, you know. That's to me, you know, you, you it kind of hits home because I, I I lived in Tulsa for for some time, and you know was around that area and had been you know Mohawk Park is used by Cherokee Nation for different events because that's kind of the northernmost part of kind of Tulsa and that that it's in the on the res, but the part that's really strange to me, um, honestly, is the fact that so. Both guys go missing, and Glenda Cookie Parton, she was 80. Um, you know, she was from Pryor, the Pryor area. But she was last seen searching for these two men on this ranch up in, Tur up in Turley in North Tulsa. Basically looking for her son. Um, which is kind of crazy is that she goes missing too. Nowhere, nowhere to be found. Um, but there was video evidence that, you know, when she was in a local business in Turley, that she was accompanied by a man, an unidentified man. Well, they basically saw that she's there with that unidentified man in that business the night before she went missing. Now, they come to find out that the unidentified man was, was basically located and he was, yeah, he was questioned. Um, and... You know, they basically couldn't, you know, couldn't cooperate anything, couldn't couldn't get him anything because he basically didn't know where they were at, where, where any of those people were. Um, but then later on, her 2016 Kia Rio was found abandoned on the side of the road of Highway 75 near 50, 56th Street in North Tulsa um, on, on October 25th, um, which is crazy because, you know, like, you, it's just crazy that those guys went missing. And then she was found, and then she goes missing. So you know what raises my mind is: is it a serial killer up in up up there, or is it you know someone you know has ties to some things up there? Well, it wasn't just them three that went missing. Um, a man named Shannon Miller, who was a member of the Cherokee Nation, 
was last seen on October 19th. Um, and is number four, it is the fourth person missing from that Turley area in that month span. Now, his girlfriend uh, left for work earlier that morning, and when she returned home, Miller was gone. The car he was driving was found by his girlfriend on October 21st um, at 106th Street North on the bridge over Bird, over Bird Creek. You know, what part, what's kind of crazy about his mis his disappearance is that his he had that basically his phone was in the car and they found his and they found his wallet and other belongings near the water of that creek. The family ended up calling and reporting him missing on the twenty fifth. So that's the fourth person in, in that park or in that area that had went missing within this month span. Which is crazy. So this was reported on November first. But human remains were found and discovered in a local area west of Turley. Um, the remains were discovered by a group of hunters, um, kind of 61st Street North and North York Trina Avenue. They said that basically the wildlife, the deputies said that wildlife had kind of spread the remains, you know, out. So, it, you know, due to predation. So which made it difficult to recover some of the, a lot of the, the remains. Well, the remains ended up being... Uh, Jack Grimes, the original guy who went missing. Um, what's crazy, like I said, what's crazy is that from that time on November 1st, they had done multiple searches. Um, they looked into Jack Grimes' home to see if they could find anything. They searched the, the, the places that, that both Glenda uh, Parton and Jack Grimes and, and uh, Dwayne Selby, they lo you know tried to locate them and tried to basically find any bit of evidence they could to, to find these people. And, you know, with finding Jack Grimes' remains, that then turns over to possibly a homicide or foul play. Um, you know, one thing that was kind of crazy to me was that they, um, in April, um, just I think about anywhere from, I guess, six months after... Not, uh, seven months after, deputies used cadaver dogs to search, the, search three areas, um, but they didn't recover any evidence um, of the search. And then they also, in March of, that, of 2022, they, they searched Grimes home for any evidence to, to get a break in the case. And I know in October, and I think mid-October, um, they did a year, um, uh, kind of a year-long type of um uh, honoring, I guess, really, but just basically asking for information. So one thing I found, you know, very interesting um, is so multiple news agencies, you know, agencies, um, you know, had reported this case. And, you know, one thing that the, the, the Tulsa County Sheriff's Office said, you know, was kind of a quote from their, their communications person that it's been weird from the beginning. The fact that we have a woman looking for her son and she goes missing as well. And the fact that we've only been able to find Jack is bizarre. You know, they also said that the case is far from cold. And this was reported on October 27, 2022. So about a, exactly a year. Um, so the, the man that they identified, um, eventually they found out to be a ranch hand for, I think it was Dwayne Selby. Um, but they questioned the man and they basically... Uh, released him, but he is still not ruled out as a suspect of this case. Um, but this uh, Fox 23 did an interview with, I think it was, I believe, the sister or the, the sister-in-law. And, you know, the sister-in-law says she knows exactly who the man was pictured um, with her mother. I was, I'm sorry, it's her mother-in-law. Um, his name was John, and basically he was a, a ranch hand, and he did uh, different ranch duties. Um one thing I find very interesting um, is they actually the 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 mother or the the daughter in law actually left her. So it was quoted her saying, uh, "Let's see if I can find this because I want to make sure I get this right." Um, it was kind of odd though. And she basically said that she saw her the night before that the night before that she went missing. And that she asked her to leave and come home. And uh, she wouldn't. 
And so I just thought that was kind of, you know, interesting. I'm not saying that she did it or, but the fact that like she didn't want to come home, um, basically she said that, um, her mother-in-law had no reason not to trust that she would vanish by the next day. I don't think there was a mo moment she thought anything was wrong, but things would take, take a turn the night because, uh, Carol and Jack's sister, Nancy, would both report that she had either saw or spoke with Cookie um, when she was left alone with John at the men's home. I heard a man's voice on the phone, and his voice uh, was that, that he was in the room with her. Carol said that about the last phone call uh, she would have with Cookie. She said at the end of the night, after a uh, long searching, a long day of searching, she would last see Cookie at the Turley Ranch alone with John. The next morning, she had vanished. But, you know, and, and then the, the daughter-in-law went on to say, we can't help but think that she found something out or saw something. We don't know. We hate that this happened. I tried to get her to come home with me, but she didn't want to. She wanted to stay there. Um, and then Nancy went on to say that she saw Cookie's car in the driveway of the men's home the night she disappeared. Carol said that her family member also reported Cookie's car was in the driveway of the Charlie Ranch before they went to bed. That family member lived by, nearby and could see the ranch out their windows. But and what's crazy is no one knows how the car got out on Highway 75. So to this day, these you know they obviously found Jack Grimes' um, remains and then and, and but they still don't know where Dwayne Selby and um, Cookie Parton are to this day, and even Shannon Miller and. You know, I, I kind of feel weird sometimes about doing missing, you know, mysterious disappearance episodes because, you know, these are real people. It's not like it's a show that I can just nitpick. You know, I just find very th very odd things about this case. And, you know, if, if anyone has any information regarding this case and, and regarding these, you know, these people so they could be found and brought home. Um, I know, you know, I've never had anyone go missing or disappear and, and to me, it's just very strange that there's certain things that um, that have happened in these in this case to for them to be gone. Um, so I want to end the podcast. I want to end this episode by saying, that hopefully, they find you know some type of peace and, and and evidence to where they can bring their family home until they know what happened to um, these three people um, and the four really four people. Um, it's that's I'm so reading you know I, I followed this this story when it first came out back in 2021 and I you know I never really saw kind of what the closure was and there and there hasn't been um, the last reported um, that I have seen now I could be wrong but was uh, October 27th 2022 um, and so you know thoughts you know hopefully you know we you know maybe the podcast it hits someone's ear that knows something you know hopefully but. Stephen Mitchell Adams, um, and I'll give you a little a backstory about that. I went to Northeastern State University um, in 2012, and at this time, when I was a freshman, they were really, really, really big on the security and the safety. Like we had multiple um, kind of meetings with campus PD. Um, at this time, now this the now this case was back in two thousand four, December thirteenth, two thousand four. But the grand jury stuff, which I'll get into that, ended December uh, twenty twelve, I believe. But at the time, I'm a freshman, and so they're 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 going through like, hey, you know, don't. You know, they had they had us download an app that basically told us, you know, to basically shared our location with police officers. You know, when we opened the app, now granted they probably was tracking us anyways, who knows? But but I remember like it was Cher like uh, the Cherokee Marshals were out there. Uh, we had Tahlequah PD. We even had some like federal agencies out there, and they just basically were going through safety measures uh, when you're going through campus at night, or even if you're off campus and and. I'd always thought about that through my time at uh, uh, NSU, which I graduated from in 2017. Um, I'd always thought about this case. And I remember being a young guy hearing about it. Um, especially growing up in Tahlequah, 
you know, being out at Cookson uh, Hills and in that area, Keys, Stillwell area, kind of Cookson, like I said, Cookson Hills type area out that way, Stillwell, kind of being on the river a lot, you know, and a lot of these things growing up were always kind of in the back of my mind. I'm sure it was in my parents' mind too, uh, especially with him going missing in the way that he went missing. And But um, let's just start, oh, we'll start from the beginning on this. And so he... So Stephen Adams went. Uh, uh, Stephen Mitchell Adams went missing um, December thirteenth, two thousand four, um, and he was an NSU student. Um, he previously had a lot of kind of turmoil in his life. He had a uh, an ex that he was battling custody with. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say any of these outer people's names because uh, they're you know they're still around and I don't want to trudge up anything. But I'm just relaying the case to you guys and he had was going through a lot of this stuff and he was having you know issues and and uh, with his custody um, but he had graduated from Haskell and he went to Haskell uh, before he moved to Tahlequah and you know he's trying to get his life right trying to make sure you know he can support his family and he ends up meeting this other girl and they end up getting together and and when they're together at the time of his disappearance in 2004. Um, kind of a notable thing, he is a native guy. I know the, it's kind of crazy that the police, you know, I guess say that he was white and whatnot, but he, he was native. Um, and one thing that I think is very interesting about the day of his disappearance, so he, uh, he went to, you know, he went to, to class um, around 8.30 and ended up getting out of, and he had basically a final exam that ended at 10.30. And this is the official timeline as well. And he woke up at 8, got to class, and basically took his final exam. No one said anything was kind of crazy or he was disheveled or he was just upset. He came in, normal, jovial self, um, and that's kind of how his mom, you know, and his family classified him as he was a, you know, he always wanted to make people feel good around them, around him. And he felt bad if something, you know, if, if something wasn't right with somebody. Or he always wanted to make sure things were, were correct. And he was a, a very charming person, according to his family. And one thing that is very interesting at, the, at this time when he's taking this final exam, there's two instances that happen um, outside while he's taking that exam. Um... During the first part, so the first hour after he left his, his apartment, uh, which his apartment was on Downing. Uh, I'm not going to give that location, that's it. And I know exactly where those apartments are. But, and if you know those apartments on Downing, then you'll know what I'm talking about. But, he left his apartment at 8 and ended up uh, going to class. And then, people that were at the apartment at the time that were leaving, they noticed a man kind of snooping around the entryway of his apartment. And the guy's description is kind of vague. Like, people say that he was wearing a gray shirt or then or a uh, kind of a tan shirt. And he was wearing, you know, because it was cold. It's December. And he, you know, was wearing, you know, kind of heavy clothing. Um, it was kind of a muddled, you know, around that time. Well... At that same time, kind of an hour later, people at Dollar General, which is down the street from that apartment, if you guys know where that Dollar General's at, um, on Downing, or off of Downing, and they spotted a dark Ford Ranger with a silver, uh, with a silver, uh, I can't think of the tool shed in the back, and a man was sitting there kind of in the parking lot waiting. Um, this is like an hour after Stephen had got to class. And it seemed like he was you know, waiting. And so the manager comes out and says, hey, you can't loiter here, but why are you here? Uh, and the person that's in the truck says, well, I'm just waiting for my, a friend uh, to take them to, to Keys. And it's very interesting because after Stephen left, um, you know, he basically told people that he was going to see his mom in Weber's Falls. And he ended up 
uh, getting a call from his his uh, then girlfriend, and basically saying that, oh hey, um, I picked this hitchhiker up. I'm taking him to Keys. Now that's where those two points meet when it comes to the investigation and and everything that went into uh, the investigation was that those two. Now it could be coincidence, but those two were were very interesting because one the guy. The manager said that he was going to, this guy was going to Keys. But then he, Stephen also said he was going to Keys and to drop this guy off. Well, this is 11 o'clock when he leaves and he's taking, and he's going headed towards uh, Weber's Falls and going to Keys. Well, at the time, the last is about 1230 ish, because it takes from Tahlequah to Keys is about 20 minutes. So around 1130 ish. Uh, people say that they see uh, Stefan. I keep saying Stephen. Stefan, because I think it's because it's in my head. Um, Stefan, they see Stefan and at this convenience store in Keys, which there's only one in the middle of town right next to the school. And also there's a Big Reds off to the left if you're going, like you're headed to Tin Keller Lake. Um, or like you're going to Cookson. Well, he stops at that convenience store in the middle of town and people, you know, have were reported that they saw him, and he was very disheveled, frustrated. Um, you know, it looked like he was going through a breakdown, like he was really upset. And he ended up going, getting in the in the truck, and then leaving and going the opposite way. You know, headed the the opposite direction of where he was supposedly headed, which was you know opposite of like. So if you keep going to Cookson, you can get to Weber's Falls through kind of windy roads, and he was going the opposite way, like he was headed back to Tahlequah. Now, that's the way it, the way it read to me. Now, maybe I might have misunderstood that, but that's the way it, it read, that they were, he was headed in the opposite direction, like he was going back to Tahlequah. Now, one thing that is kind of, and this is, a, like, I'll, I'll give some background of, like, you know, what I know about Tahlequah. Like, picking up hitchhikers was not, like, a, like a unusual thing, like crazy story. My dad, when we were kids, we were all sitting. He had this old, this Oldsmobile. I guess it was Oldsmobile, but it was like a white car with red uh, kind of. Uh, let's say it was a hoopty. Let's just say that, and it was white, uh, and it had this red uh, seating, which was like ugly. And we're driving. And my dad just picks up this guy, like just haphazardly. Hey, pulls over, says, "Hey, man, you need a ride." And the guy goes, "Yeah," and hops in. My dad takes him where he needs to go, and then, like that was like that was a normal thing in Tahlequah. You always help people, and then you kind of always think the best of people. And so that's not out of the realm, in my opinion, that he picked somebody up and dropped him off keys, and then maybe had car trouble, and then realized, "Hey, if I go towards Weber's Falls, I'm not gonna have nothing. Like, there's nothing there. Like, it's all wilderness." And, you know, the the road. So there's not going to be anywhere I can, you know, get car service. And so that could be another caveat of why he turned back the opposite way. Now, one thing that's very kind of strange about this is they found... So after, you know, after they see him and nobody can get a hold of him. I know, he, I think his mom called him and then it, it rang twice and then... Or his friend called him. Or no, I'm sorry. His roommate called him, which I guess his friend called him, and basically it rang twice and then disconnected, like it, like they rejected the call. And then they called again, and it went straight to voicemail. So the phone's off, and so he had a cell phone too. So it's not like it's oh, it's pay phone or anything like that, you know. But so the 14th happens. So it's a Tuesday, and they're realizing, hey, he didn't show up for his his second exam, his finals. Um, and everyone thought that was kind of strange. Like, okay, like, there's something wrong. Calling him, can't get a hold of him. And, you know, they he just disappeared off the face, face of the earth, basically. Nobody can find anything. And, you know, family over the years um, leading up to, you know, them opening a grand jury um, on this case and trying to figure out and try to see if they can open up an OSBI investigation, um, you know, I find it very interesting that his car was found by the Illinois River. And it was basically wiped clean. And, you know, ele- you know, 
according to the to the investigation, that basically his car was stolen and all his books, because each book is given a number, so you can track that book to who who owned it. Well, his car was wiped clean, like nothing was in there, like everything was basically stripped out and stolen. Um, that was in the car, like belongings and whatnot. And his book was eventually sold, I think right before his disappearance, which is kind of weird in itself. Maybe he was getting rid of stuff. Um, but they found the truck and it was like I said, there was nothing in it. Everything that he had in there was gone. And that's one thing that's kind of strange to me. So if, if like he was driving back to Tahlequah, you would have to take, uh, a certain road to get to the river. Like you'd have to go back up through, uh, I'm trying to think of the, that actual road, but you'd have to go through Tahlequah just a little bit and then take a right and you'd get to the river and um, get back into, uh, anyways, I'm, I'm getting to minutia, but, so I thought it was very strange that his truck ended up there and it was basically stripped clean of everything and books were sold and it was just very strange. Um, and so as the years roll on, his parents um, find, you know, they're, they're basically trying to fight to, to get him, his case looked at and they eventually opened up, opened up a grand jury um, on the case and the investigation now, his ex, this is another crazy part of this investigation, is his ex, t- at the time now, polygraphs, you know, now we, we deem them as not admissible in court. Uh, but now, but at the time, she failed the polygraph. And they asked her, like, where do you know where he's at? You know, where, where did you last see him? Like, all this stuff and all these questions. And she failed the polygraph test, which I find is very interesting. Um, they did the, the jury, grand jury thing, and they went through, and basically they, uh, the findings were, were that there were people in court that they called as witnesses to, in this grand jury, that had lied on the stand. And they know that they lied, because their stories weren't adding up. And I'm not going to say any of these people, any of these people names, like I said, people are still around. Um, but here's another thing, too, is that you know, they, they introduced these five theories. You know, one of them is that he committed suicide, which is, to me, is not, I don't find that to be a possible one, in my opinion. Um, another theory was they had car trouble, and but they did rule it a homicide. Like, like, the, like that one was the, the, the only one that wasn't that leading to a homicide. That he was killed by the hitchhiker. Um, that there had to be some familiar homicide basically someone he knew um and then um uh basically accidental death you know or something of that nature so but majority of them were homicide is what is what it was deemed but the theory that i that i think is most prevalent i think somebody was trying to catch him now like i said in these small towns you beef with somebody like they they may come and get you like they may try to you know mess with you or try to you know hurt you you know try to kidnap you and beat you up and then be like don't mess with my my brother don't mess with my sister don't mess with my cousin no more and i think what happened was is he was meeting somebody out at keys or met somebody at keys and this person threatened him and said hey you know, and Steve, you know, Stefan's like, you know what, man, I don't need to hear this, you know, blah, 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 this, and he ends up getting, they, they take it too far, and they end him, kill him, murder him, and I have to believe, it, I believe, in my opinion, it's one of the family members of his ex, I believe, or someone that she knew, or maybe a new lover, or a new, you know, relationship, whatever, and, because a lot of this, a lot of that stuff, you know, we see it all the time in, in true crime, but you know, I think it was could have been that. Uh, when it comes to when it comes to the theories, is that someone took it too far and he ended up murdering him, and then you know now they got they got to clean up the evidence. Because I find it very strange that the grand jury said that there are multiple people in this case that that were lying, and that it should be investigated. Now, um, I did some research to try to find the latest kind of rumblings about it 
and there, you know, there's not much. Basically, it's still an open case. Um, you know, still haven't heard anything. You know, people are still looking, but his his family um, is still, you know, looking to find justice for him. Which that's a lot of reason why I talk about local stuff, like stuff that's you know around here, is because you know he's missing. It's just closure. You know, I've had family members who pass not by those means, but just, um, but, you know, it's always good to have a little bit of closure with that. And, and I hope that, you know, at, at some point that somebody comes forward and says something and, and, cause I know that they have had different people come forward and, and, uh, you know, say, Hey, this person did this or this person did that. Um, just, you know, this is town, basically town hearsay. But, you know, it could be true. You just never know. Oh, and one thing, too, I forgot. So right after his disappearance, um, New Year's, I think it was New Year's Day or right after New Year's, they got a phone call from somebody saying, you, you know, you need, like, I think it was the family, um, you need to stop looking into this case. You need to tell his girlfriend to stop looking into this case um, or we're going to hurt you. Now, I thought, you know, to me, you know, that sounds like some small town, you know, you know, type stuff. Oh, don't talk about it or we're, you know, we'll, we'll do something to you. And, you know, it's just like I said, that's part of my theory. Like I said, I don't know what, what has transpired. I'm, you know, all this is alleged, you know, when it comes to this theories and the people involved. But, you know, hopefully I, I hope that, uh, you know, something comes down the pipeline or they can do some type of, uh, you know, data, you know, analyzing where his cell phone pinged, because I know, you know, I mean, they may not be able to pull that stuff, but, you know, it's always worth a try, but, um, but yeah, this, that case has always kind of been at the back of my mind, you know, for a long time, especially going to school there, and, you know, here, hearing rumblings about things, you know, and, and people talking about, you know, almost talking about it like in a, a spooky way, like, oh, you better not, do this or you'll end up, you know, gone, you know, or took. And so, you know, I always, I always wanted to, uh, you know, look, look more into it. And, and, and the pod, this podcast has, you know, allowed me, you know, not really allowed me, but I'm always looking into stuff, but I always, you know, found it very interesting that he, and yeah, he's gone. Like he just disappeared and we can't find it, you know, where he's at and nobody knows where he's at and, or, you know, allegedly, but you know, what do you guys think about that case? And, you know, do you know, you know, maybe, do you know something like, you know, let, let somebody know if you know something, you hear this, you're like, dang, you know, it's been, yeah, almost 20 years, you know, it's time to let his family, you know, have some justice and have some rest and some peace and, and things like that. Cause it is very sad, especially happening to native, you know, natives are going missing every day. You know, it feels like I see something every day and it just kind of makes me sad. It makes me real sad when I see that, cause you know, I think it's, you know, I think it's just, it's almost become like a normal thing. Like, Oh, there's another kid missing or another woman missing or somebody murdered this person. You know, it's just, it's just sad. It's just really sad to me. And you know, there's not very many of us left. I mean, there's a lot of us left, but there's not very many, you know, of us than there, what there could be. You know, I was thinking, and I mentioned this before, Imagine that person that was, you know, took what life they could have gave more over here and how many more native people we have and traditions that were passed on and, and, and things like that. And I always think about that, like, you know, man, dang, you know, if, you know, if we didn't have all these people missing, you know, we would have more stories. We'd have more, uh, tradition. We would have, you know, we'd have a lot of these things. And I go, and I think about the boarding schools on that too as well. But one thing about, you know, true crime, it's true. And sometimes it is kind of hard to talk about true crime, especially especially in the state of Oklahoma. You know, we we have people that go missing quite a bit. I know certain states are that way. And, you know, eventually I'll be talking about the this highway that goes through basically the entire country. And, you know, there's a serial killer that, you know, was frequent that. And, you know, it's kind of crazy too, kind of not on topic of this, but you know, the FBI did some type of survey, I want to say about five to 10 years ago. And they said that there's possibly active like 200 serial killers and like a certain percentage of them are truck drivers. It's kind of crazy, you know, just thinking, 
you know, truck drivers are out here wiling out, you know, but it's kind of crazy. But on this episode, we're going to be talking about, well, I'm going to be talking about the Jamison family um, out of Eufaula, Oklahoma. And this story has been covered quite a bit. I would say, I, you know, was doing some research and looking into who's talked about it. And, you know, it's, I don't, it's talked about, but it's not talked about like, you know, the Girl Scouts um, murders or anything like that. But one thing that struck me as odd about this is that, you know, we I did an episode about cults and there's some of that, you know, going on. But the Jameson family um, disappeared in 2009 uh, looking at some property out, I think it's the San Boys Mountains um, and near, I, it's, I think it's Kenta. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but, but near that town. And uh, one thing that was kind of crazy about that is they both were unemployed and they both were on disability. And the re, you know, when they went to find, or when they realized that they were missing and they went and found their truck, the crazy part about it to me is I've looked at land and I've looked at property before, and you basically take everybody, you know, but they left their dog, which their dog, that's, I mean, that's crazy, leaving your dog in there. And the dog survived, ate its own feces and survived off that until, you know, the authorities came and, you know, saw the truck. But another weird thing about it is they had all their belongings in there. Wallets, um, letters, you know, coats, clothing, all types of stuff in there. But the weird thing about it is there's like $32,000 of money in that. And that's kind of interesting because, you know, if you look at their situation, they had kind of had some financial problems. You know, they uh, they also were dealing with things that are, are unexplained and we kind of kick it back to, you know, what happened to them. They just disappeared. Um, and one thing that is very odd, and I'll get into some theories now. So they go missing, and they find their body in November 2013. When they get the the, the bodies back from the autopsies, they, it's inconclusive. They don't know what happened to them. The bodies were so, you know, majorly decayed, and it was basically just bones. But they found all three family members. Um, about three miles from the truck where they found it. And the first theory, which I think is a good one, you know, they were probably on drugs, you know, probably owed somebody some money, and they were trying to weasel their way out of that in some form or fashion. And, you know, possibly, you know, they could have got took. Your life could have got took, all three of them. You know, I saw some theories out there that basically, you know, they were using that as like ransom money. Their daughter was kidnapped or something of, of the nature, and they were using that money for ransom. Um, that was another theory that I saw another theory that I find very interesting. And, you know, I, I maybe don't think it's as likely, but, um, the dad, Bob was having trouble with his dad and basically his dad was working him for free. So he would work at this family business that they owned and, and he wouldn't pay. And he was supposed to get a pro like a, a cut of that profit. And maybe it could have been something with the family. You know, we always look, in every investigation, they always talk about it's always someone in the family or someone close. Um, at the time, they you know that they were going through this, or they disappeared. They sued um, other family members and you know allegedly put out a protective order against the dad, against Bob's Bobby's dad, because he, uh, I guess, essentially was just crazy. They said that he in the kind of in the affidavit they talked about uh, the the father Jameson said that basically his dad was a very powerful man and he was very involved in the drug trade, uh, sex trafficking, things of that nature. And he was involved in a lot of things in that, like that nature. And he hit him with a car, beat him up. I was like, dang, he's like 67 years old out here just wilding out, just going crazy. But he, he had said that in that affidavit. So that was some issues that they were going through you know, with his dad. You know, the the next theory is is that, you know, that they were under possession, that they were possessed. And I I find it very interesting after the fact when they were going through the investigation and they, they had a, a home family uh, security camera. And when they were looking at that camera, they noticed that the Jamesons were leaving on that day or, you know, somewhere near it or like before, basically packing, but they looked weird. And I think the thing that's kind of strange to me is – you know, the sheriff at the time, Sheriff Beecham, he had said that the that or he and news articles had said that they looked like they were in a trance, like they were just 
you know, walking, but there was no like, you know, some people just walk and they kind of tell that there's light, you know, that some of you know, be walking the way they walk. Well, these, they said these people are kind of almost robotic. And a really strange kind of, you know, part of that is when they would like unload stuff, like and put it like kind of in a trance like state, they would just stare off into space for a decent amount of time. So like they would put the stuff up and they would just stare. And, you know, they multiple news articles basically said that they kind of just off into space for a couple, like a minute or two, you know, which is kind of creepy because if you've seen those exorcist movies, you're like, they'll do that, like looking off into space and there's just no life in the eyes. I can imagine that now, but, but that was another theory that they were maybe possessed and, you know, they could have did something, but, but another, like kind of a caveat to that and some more information came out later on. Um, but the, their, their pastor, they, the pastor come out and gave some information that essentially that the dad was um, essentially asking for, he called special bullets. And he had confessed to this pastor or this priest about uh, basically their house being haunted and that their house had multiple spirits in it and that the younger daughter was not influenced, so I'd say, but was taking recommendations from the youngest uh, what she said was youngest spirit, which I think that's kind of crazy because we always talk about, or I've talked about like imaginary friends and you know, my, if my daughters get to have imaginary friends, no, 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 not today. We're going to do something to this house. We're going to do something. That, like, I'm not, I've seen too many movies where that imaginary friend was not an imaginary friend, but they said that, that the daughter was like, had become friends with this spirit. Um, and there was a lot of weird stuff in his, the, the father, uh, he was like, went to the priest and was like, man, how do we get, you know, special bullets to get rid of these spirits? And then he also had confessed that he had been studying a satanic Bible. And another caveat to that same is that the, the wife, Sherilyn, she had said and admitted to a friend that she had purchased, quote unquote, in jest, and that she had purchased a Bible, an occult Bible, and was studying it and reading it. And she was doing it out of like mockery of that, you know, I guess religion or something, I guess. But I think that's very interesting, you know, that they were into those things, but like they didn't want to be, you know, to me, it sounds like they were into it and they didn't know how to be not into it. Like it was so intriguing to them that they did these things and, and now they had spirits and, and, you know, they had witchcraft Bibles. Well, then this leads me to the final theory. And at the time, you know, multiple people around them said that they had be, become very, like, fanatically religious, and that you know they were a part of this like ritual, like uh, not ritual, religious cult. And you know, at the time that you know the they when they disappeared, there was a lot of these specials running, and a pa- a friend of the mother, which her last name was like Kokatan, Miss Kokatan is what I'll call her. She got a call from a from a friend of hers that was in that area, and they said basically she had found out that they were a part of a of a religious white supremacist group out in southeast Oklahoma. And you know the crazy thing about that is in Oklahoma back in like ninety three or ninety two they had come out, and I read the article like basically it just sums up that hey yeah there are religious white supremacist type of uh cults in that area but they haven't had any movement on like if they were disturbing the public or anything like that and basically the fbi and the local authorities kind of just chalked it up to just people being you know living with their their own people i guess but the friend told miss Kokatan, which is cheryl lynn jameson's mother told her that hey they were actually on a hit list for some reason and and I found, and, you know, she found that out somehow, which kind of tells me, kind of makes me wonder if the, you know, if the mother was the one that introduced him, because how would she have a friend that knew those people? Well, to go along with that theory is the mother came out in a Daily Mail article and also did an interview with the Oklahoman and denied that all her, uh, her family were a part of, like they weren't, they were not into witchcraft. They were not doing that but they were a target because they had spoken out against this cult which is odd how would she know that or how would she assume that and you know that they that they did have you know different types of ghosts and and different activity following them and 
like I said, the very strange thing, you know, it, and this is another thing that kind of goes back to missing 411, is that they will search an area, and then the bodies will be found, you know, sometime after, in the same location that they looked. And that's what happened in 2013, is they, you know, comb that area, every area around that truck, and, you know, the, the investigators chalked it up. Oh, well, it was just a tree on top of them. Well, if you found the body in plain area with no shrubs around it, but you could tell it was human bones, like, come on, something's off. But that cult thing is very interesting because we do have those, in that, and especially in that area. You know, they're, like I said, I mentioned the Oklahoman article that talked about, you know, I'm sure it's probably grown or, you know, maybe, maybe is now defunct. But that last theory is very intriguing to me, you know, because why would the mother come out and, and deny those and, and basically say that, oh, it was a cult hit, hit list. They were on that list. And why were they on that list? You know, the mother also came out and said that basically that her daughter was acting erratic. Um, they drove to Oklahoma City and basically kicked her out of the car, like didn't allow her to, you know, be there anymore. Which, if y'all knew my mom, my mom would be looking at me crazy. But, <clears throat> excuse me, but it, yeah, it's just very interesting, you know, what happened to them. And to this day, I know they, they, you know, there's still people out there that are trying to figure it out. And, you know, it's just crazy that like 10 years later, or just a little over 10 years, that there's still basically no resolve in that case. And, you know, I follow a, a cold case group on Facebook out of Oklahoma. It's a Oklahoma cold cases. And I've seen that. That's, you know, how I kind of came across this case. But, I think there's a lot of weird stuff going on, and we've, you know, I've stated this multiple, multiple times that that area, it's like mid, like a, you follow in Shakota, and that area falls in like a weird area. It's just a very strange area, and like south of that, and then in the southeast, it's just a very strange area. But let me know, let me know if you have heard this case, or it's just something that you know, you, maybe you put it on the back burner, burner, didn't really think about it, you know, because like I said, there there's still no resolve in that case, and you know, the circumstances surrounding it is very weird. Oh, before I kind of put a close on that, that fourth theory I talk about with the cult, there was a weird, like, messages in the truck. And one of them said, and I'm going to try to remember, but it was said three cats killed due to uh, buying people. And it said at the end, it was like, uh, you must not kill a person's black cat, which is very, <laughs> which is a very strange message. Like, if y'all, if you heard that and you're like, man, that actually, you know, I think I know what that means. Let me know because I, I'm, I was sat here and thought about it. I was like, I don't really know what that means, you know. But we always talk about witchcraft and black cats, and then black cats symbolizing, you know, darkness or you know, a type of trick, you know, that someone can be played. But let me know what you think about that. That this case, um, it's very interesting. But like I said, I appreciate it. And um, merch store, don't forget that. Christmas is coming up. There'll be deals. You know, hit the link um, that in the in the description or in the bio, and go follow me on TikTok, uh, Warcry Pod. And then if you got a story, uh, this is Creepy Five will be coming out New Year's Day. That's coming up quick. I know I've gotten a few stories so far, um, but don't forget to send your story in. You know, I'll keep you anonymous. We'll do the whole thing. I'll just you know give me a kind of an area. You can say a county. You can just give me an area, and, and we'll get it rocking. But I appreciate those that listen and continue to support the podcast, and I'll catch you on the next one.